So because of the timing of events and uh, the time of where we are, um, how many Sundays are left, I'm going to keep going about elders this afternoon where normally I might pivot to a different topic, uh, sometimes for fear of repeating yourself or of repeating yourself, but not today. <laughs> today, uh, these are actually sufficiently distinct from one another that there's not too much danger of repeating yourself. Um, and with not very many Sundays left and an assignment from the men to cover this topic in a month, I'm going to keep going on are you elder material? And uh, again, the angle here is you better be, which is just to say, yeah, you know what these things are, and they're good things that that is what you're looking for. So we're trying to use the rest of the Bible to define the terms to help us understand that, yeah, we do know what these are. We are currently... at 1 Timothy 3, verse 3, on this word, not violent, but gentle. There are really only a couple of different occurrences uh, for the word here that is used that means violent. It would be here and the qualifications for elders in Titus 1. So... I think um, there's a translation of Titus 1 that calls it quick-tempered in that place. Um, and that seems like they would be very similar. Violent and quick-tempered are very similar. But then, gentle occurs actually in Philippians 4, uh, in the fifth verse, as reasonableness. Let your reasonable reasonableness be known to everyone which is literally the same term as the qualification for the elder, is that gentleness. We'll talk about that. But Philippians 4 makes sense for this term, and, and that's what we're about to say. Uh, the fact is, in Philippians 4, we're taking our, our cares and concerns to God, putting those upon him, and walking away from that, um, without that anxiety weighing us down. In the sense, then, that you rely on God and you let the worry fall on Him, let the battle be His, instead of trying to take things into your own hands or carry all of the burdens alone, in that sense, uh, your reasonableness can be known to everyone. You're reasonable in the sense that you're not overcome with anxiety, fret, worry about what will happen or what will be the outcome. Gentleness, on the other hand, is kind of an aspect of um, you are not going to necessarily force the outcome you're going to stay within yourself, stay within control, be strong, and, you know, let this move forward. <laughs> In the case of Philippians 4, you can do this because you've given the concern to God. It's not that you're not uh, addressing it or not concerned about it. It's just that you've done the right thing by giving that to God to care for. So that's where he's coming from. That's how those word, you know, how that same word kind of has two different, uh, or what appear to be two different interpretations. They really are the same thing. Um, if, if you're thinking about the, the illustration that um, th that he's giving for how we bring our concerns to God by relying on Him and then count on Him to care for it instead of carrying the concern ourselves. That is the same way in which somebody would be perhaps not violent but gentle. Uh, the violent or the striker or the quick-tempered is the person who, try, who takes matters into his own hands and is not in control. So Philippians 4, verse 4, beginning, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I tell you, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, 
let your request be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses every way of thinking, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. So again, when you rely on God and let the worry fall to him instead of trying to do it yourself, you can stay in control. Um, you know, we were told not to be anxious for every for anything. Uh, can anybody be anxious for everything? Well, no. Uh, we were told to make our needs and our requests, our injustices and mistreatments known to God and leave that to him. Can anybody take that into their own hands? Uh, are you allowed to be known as somebody who is not gentle, somebody who is not reasonable, cannot be approached or quick-tempered? Um, no, no Christian should be like that under any real circumstance in life. No Christian should be known for those kinds of things. So no Christian can be something that is other than gentle. It's something that we understand. It's about, well, who's in control here and who, where does justice come from? Do I bring about my own outcomes or do I rely on God to bring those outcomes? It's a life of faith that we're talking about. So yes, you know what it means to be not violent, but gentle. Quarrelsome is related. Quarrelsome meaning somebody who fights. <laughs> it only, this word also quarrelsome only occurs in the qualifications for elders, fair enough. But the root of quarrel is fight and the fights do have a nice explanation in James 4. What, says James, what causes quarrels or fights? What causes fights among you? Isn't it this, your passions are at war within you? You desire and don't have, so you murder? You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel? You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Adulteresses, don't you know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Well, James is fairly plain about this when he explains and examines the source of fighting, the source of quarrels. Where is this coming from? It's that you have passions within you that are at war. There are things, desires that you hold on to inside that are at war, and that is erupting in fights. Why fights? Because you desire and don't have, so you murder. Covet and can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. That's where it's coming from. Well, why, you know, you don't have because you don't ask. Right? you got to pray if you want to get the answer to the prayer. You have to ask. And then somebody says, well, I did ask. Well, you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly. To spend it on your passions. Rather than to accomplish God's will, you're asking for something that is not really a pertinent matter to the soul. Well, no, that isn't going to happen. Um, and no, I don't mean your health. <laughs> Third John speaks of, you know, uh, I pray that it may go with you, that you, you may be in health as your soul is in health. He prayed for physical health for the recipient of the letter of Third John. That's perfectly scriptural. Nothing wrong with asking for that. I have heard people say, might as well ask for a Cadillac. Uh, no, um, that's not the same thing as your health, your ability to live and work and earn for your family, your dependents, the congregation. Yeah, that, that ain't the same thing. James is talking about these wrong passions, these desires to be at peace with the world, to get along with the world. That's where the fights come from on the, in, uh, on the inside. The fights are the outside of that. And if we wish to be friends of the world, we are enemies of God. It cannot be. 
So, no, he cannot be quarrelsome. And we, again, would say, is James 4 written to everybody? Well, yeah, it is. Nobody really is allowed to have passions at war within. Nobody is allowed to murder in order to obtain or to ask for wrong things in prayer. The head of your enemy or Cadillac or something like this. No, no Christian is allowed to do this. Are we allowed to make friends of the world? And I don't mean people who are not Christians. Of course, people who are not Christians can still be your friends. That's not what we mean. We mean friendship with the things of the world, with sin, all that is in the world, the desires of the eyes, desires of the flesh, pride of life. We can't compromise with that stuff. Nobody can. So it isn't a matter of, uh, you know, well, that guy there, he's just super argumentative. And if you stick with him long enough, it's going to come to, to blows. Say, oh, okay, well, then he should lead the first prayer then, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> he should be withdrawn from because he's quarrelsome. Whether he's going to be an elder or not is irrelevant. Right, that, that's the point is, yeah, we know what this is. No, you're not a fighter. You're not a murderer. You're not after your own interests. You're not trying to make compromise with the world. The next term in 1 Timothy 3, at verse 3, is not a lover of money. A lover of money, which is a thing. That certainly is a, a thing that happens in life. There are a number of passages that we can go to. I've selected Hebrews 13 because it keeps with the theme we've been talking about, trusting God, relying on God. So Hebrews 13, uh, 5, beginning, keep your life free from love of money. Be content with what you have because he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's better than any material possession. Because he has said this, we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? So they're not temporal situations or temporal consequences that can overtake our spiritual um, wellness or salvation with God. The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? That doesn't mean they can't do things to you, they can but it means, oh, that does happen, but I will not be separated from the love of Christ. I will not be separated from my God so long as I maintain my integrity, my faithfulness to him. And so I rely on him. I trust in him. This is characterized, again, at Hebrews 13.5, by being free from it. The life is free from it. By being content with what you already have. And we can be content because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's nothing else that we need more than for God to be with us. Even if all the world forsake us, even if every earthly pleasure uh, flees from us, yet God will never leave or forsake us, and that's what we need. And so we learn a certain contentment, uh, acceptance of our situation, our lot. But yeah, there's a connection, isn't there, between, you know, trusting God never to leave or forsake us here in Hebrews 13 and the trusting God in Philippians 4 by handing him our every worry and being able to walk away from that guarded in mind, knowing that it belongs to God and he will, he will take care of it. I think there's a connection there. The lover of money is somebody who's fearful, who needs an insurance policy, if you will. Because God's provision may not be enough for them. And so then we ask, who is allowed to love money? <laughs> who is allowed to be discontented, to say, this is not enough for me, God, I need more, right? <laughs> to lack confidence that God will help. Who is allowed to, to say, well, I would put your trust in something, but I don't know if God is it. I, how, let's use this money instead. Money answers everything. Yeah, I don't think so. 
Or, on the other hand, you think about Job saying, we accept um, blessing from God, will we not accept adversity too? He didn't blame God for adversity, but he said it comes and we accept it and we don't blame God. We still bless God with our mouth. We still worship God, even when there's adversity. Yeah, is anyone allowed to blame God for the adversity they face in their lives? No, not really. No? Is anybody allowed to put money first, to put money above spiritual things? No, no, no Christian is. Elders are not supposed to do that, but nobody is supposed to do that. Next verse of 1 Timothy 3, managing his own household well. And this is a, a thing that is necessary. He is, in fact, required to be a father. So, um, in this sense, that he must be a father, this is more stringent than the requirement to get into heaven, because you're not required to be a parent in order to go to heaven. <laughs> you can go to heaven never having had a child. That is allowed in God. That won't keep you out of heaven. Okay, but in that so in that sense, the fact that he must be a father is over and above the requirement for everybody, if you will. But on the other hand, it's not a different kind of father from any other father in Christ. Anybody who is going to be a parent is going to be this kind of parent if they're going to be right with God. You are, as If you are the father, you are the head of that house, you are required to manage the household well, meaning to have it under control, to have it cared for and watched. In Titus 3 is the other place where we see this same term where, you know, in 1 Timothy we're talking about the management of his household, and clearly we are talking about the people who live in that house and how he runs it. In Titus 3, we're talking a little more generally about management in the sense of a devotion. There's a thing that you watch, that you attend to, that you are following, that you're ensuring is going the way that it should be going, and make correction if necessary along the way. That's the idea. So Titus 3, you know, at verse 8, it says, I want you to insist on these things, that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. This devote is the word for managing the household well, too. And it makes sense if you think about it, because in our own lives, and this Titus 3 here, this is a general admonition for all Christians. But it makes sense. If in our own lives we have believed in God, then we have from then forward to be careful and devoted to good works. That means that you watch yourself, you check in with yourself to see, am I actually following through with these things that belong to God? are God's um, priorities and God's initiatives, God's um, uh, things that he wants accomplished in the life of the Christian, are those the things that I am accomplishing? And if they aren't, then what do I need to do for a little course correction here? That's the idea of you've believed in God, so be careful to devote yourself to good works. This is excellent. This is profitable, meaning... When we say excellent, I mean, that's the thing that excels. That's better than all the other things you could be doing. This is profitable, not in the sense of we love money and we're looking for return. In the sense of this is actually good. It does something that is valuable, that is worth having done. Being devoted to good works, being careful about that life and watching it. So it is with our household. We watch that household. We're careful in devoting ourselves to the household to see that it's going the way it's supposed to be going and keep it on track, right? Titus 3, 14, let our people learn to devote themselves to good work so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. 
Once again, you see a correspondence here to the excellent and profitable. Cases of urgent need are, you know, what goes beyond. That's what excels. And don't be unfruitful. Right. Be profitable instead. Do something that is actually useful, that brings forth fruit for God. Let the people learn to devote themselves to good works. <clears throat> This is the sense in which managing the household well is intended. The, the father, any Christian father, is supposed to be watching. Can the Christian allow unfaithfulness just to skate? <laughs> like some evil is being done in your household and you just stand by and watch it? Don't say anything, don't correct them, don't change course, don't get in front of them and say, yo, what is this? Uh-uh. No, you can't do that. There's no father who is allowed to do that, whether he wants to be an elder or not. For that matter, there's no mother who's allowed to do that. And she certainly doesn't want to be an elder. <laughs> You can't just let things slide. You can't stand by while nothing's happening or God's purposes are not being accomplished. If you don't pursue what makes for fruitfulness or profitability, something good in the Lord, how are you doing the will of God? So, yeah, you, everybody who has, you know, you're not required to have a household to go to heaven, I understand. You may just be one single person, that's fine. True, but if you do marry, if you do have children, in this case, a household means that you have children, maybe even live in servants, that you are seeing to it that evil doesn't slide. The purposes of God are being accomplished by this household. That's the thing. You are devoted in that way to seeing the outcomes that God wants. And no, no Christian is allowed to let it slide. We all have to love the souls of those who are around us enough to stand up to them and tell them when they're wrong. We have to. Remember um, in Mark 10, when Jesus, the, 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 um, the account of the rich young ruler. Uh, I laugh because he's never called the rich young ruler. But when you put all of the different accounts together, he is the rich young ruler. But um, anyway, Mark's account is very good because it says Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, one thing you lack. Because of his love for him, he told him what was missing, right? That's all you're looking for. Any Christian is looking for that. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 4, keeping his children submissive, yes. Also true, again, the, the elder has to be a father. That's not a negotiable. <laughs> it's not like you can just demonstrate that, yes, you're devoted to good works. Therefore, you can be, no, you still have to be a father who is devoting your family to good works. <laughs> yeah, and so it is here. You have to be a father, a parent. True. But you don't have to be a father who is different from any other Christian father in the sense that every Christian father is required to keep the children in submission. We, let's talk about this for a bit. It's always controversial talking about the discipline of children. <laughs> the fact is that godly parents keep the kids in line. You know, you have to set boundaries and you have to enforce boundaries. That's how it is. Yes, I see those shaking heads out there, but we'll deal with you later. Godly parents keep the children inside the lines. To Luke 2, 51, Jesus himself was subject to his mother and father, Joseph and Miriam, Mary. He went down with his parents and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them, even after having said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Um, he went back with them and was subject and submissive to them until he became of age. And in, in that society, in that time, that was 30 years. Um, which I think Spain is very similar to that today. I think you're not really considered your own until you're 30. And there might be reasons for that. But um, 
whatever it might be, we know for sure that he lived with them and he began his public ministry at about age 30. And so we know that he was subject to them. And they wanted him to be with the family, to be, you know, in the head count where they knew where he was and could keep an eye on him and realize that he was safe, especially when they were traveling out of town in the big city. It all makes sense. Every parent has those kinds of rules, and it's very reasonable, and Jesus did not contradict that. Um, on the other hand, you got Hebrews 12, verse 9, saying, We had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them, didn't we? Well, yes. Our earthly fathers were not perfect. True. But we still respected them because they were fathers. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Well, yes. God is a perfect Father. Um, it is the role of the parents to discipline the kids, to keep them in line. And you may or may not agree with some of the lines that they draw. Get your own family. But God the Father is a perfect Father who always draws the lines accurately and is always right when he corrects us. Why then, you might ask, does God not have more children when he is the perfect father and the perfect teacher? I wouldn't ask that if I were you. But people do ask things like that. That's not the issue. That shows that you don't understand. You know, discipline is not imposed upon you. Discipline is your attitude towards authority. Romans 13 covers the fact that Christians are submissive, not just to earthly fathers, but they're submissive even to governing authority. We have governments, and just like earthly fathers, they're doing what they think is best, trying to make the best outcomes and the best policies that they think will effect the best situation for the nation. That's what they're doing, at least that's what we believe that they are doing, the good ones are. And that's true for fathers as well, the good ones, that's what they're trying to do. And we who are fathers also readily admit that sometimes we got it wrong. We are trying to do the best, to make the best decision, to make the best policy, to set the rule where it should be, and maybe that wasn't the right thing the best thing. We didn't know that this other thing was about to happen. That happens, but God's never wrong about it. And even though that does happen, and fathers admit that they do make mistakes or sometimes make the wrong call because they can't see the future, nobody can, and governments also make the wrong call, cannot see the future accurately, and make rules or laws that Perhaps you would say we shouldn't have or shouldn't keep, but the Bible still says what it does to the Christians who are at Rome. <laughs> and it's no secret, at the time of the writing of the letter, you read through the book of the Acts, it's no secret that Rome had plenty of government corruption. They crucified Jesus. Yeah, there's plenty of corruption, and yet, Paul said, let every person be subject to governing authorities because there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, that doesn't mean that God placed Nero as emperor. It means God instituted that there should be such a thing as government. Christians are not supposed to be anarchists. No, you know, God didn't vote for Trump or vote for Biden, but God wants us to have governing authority. Somebody is the leader, and we are subject to a leader. That is of God, right? And we as Christians are to be subject to governing authority. Christians are subject to... Even in Titus 3, 1, remind them, be submissive to rulers and authorities, be obedient, be ready for every good work. Whatever good thing there is that we might be called to do, be ready to do that. And 1 Peter, same thing. 
chapter 2, verses 13 to 14, subject, be subject for God, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor, that's Rome, or to governors, but do this as though they had been sent by God to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good, because as a rule, that is true. As a rule, the people who go to jail are the people who have done something evil. As a rule, punishments are befalling people who have done evil things. As a rule, those who are receiving medals and honors in the highest echelons and halls of our government are those who are doing good. I understand, not everybody, and we can all point to those exceptions, I get it, because they're humans, and they're imperfect humans. It's just like Dad didn't get everything right. But as a rule, he does no better than you when he's lived about ten times as long as you. That's just how it's going to be. <laughs> we are called for the Lord's sake to be subject. Now, why read this? Because I want you to understand we are all called to be subject to one another as Christians because of the Lord for the sake of the Lord, and it's for the reverence of the God who called us, First Peter 5.5 5 tells you, you younger ones, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. We're subject to one another, we're clothed with humility, because God gives grace to the humble. Now remember, we were reading James 4 earlier about enmity with God by means of friendship with the world. The rest of that passage is, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. We're called to be subject, to choose to be subject to authority. You've also got 1 Corinthians 16, where he calls out the household of Stephanus the first converts among the Greeks, that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. And look how close that is to our other readings. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Interesting. Be subject to such persons as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. We're called to do this in the Lord, generally. And of course, Ephesians 5, in the worship, be filled with the Spirit, singing and teaching and admonishing one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, Ephesians 5.21. Because of the Lord, for the sake of the Lord, because of reverence for the Lord, we submit to one another. So subjection is a thing that is not understood. You know, subjection or, um, what, humility, submission, discipline, how, different ways of kind of talking about the same thing. It's not well understood. Okay, but really, nobody is allowed to advocate disobedience to the government. As a Christian, you cannot call for that. It's not allowed. You read the passages same as I did. You know what they say. They say what they say. That's not what you do. I'm not saying you can't vote. I'm not saying you can't disagree and have a good, earnest discussion or debate about policy. That's fine. But advocating outright disobedience to governing authority? No, you don't, You cannot do that as a Christian, no. Can you refuse to be subject to other people during the worship services? A failure uh, to have reverence for Christ and therefore a failure to have respect for authority? No, nobody's allowed to do that. Can a parent fail to discipline their own children falling in line with this, this pattern that we see. If you zoom all the way out to the worship services of the church where we come together willingly and we're subject to one another for the order of the worship, but maybe even to governing authority. In some sense, you're subject willingly. I know eventually they will come with guys with guns and boxes to put you in, but really you basically are choosing to be a law-abiding citizen Right? We listen to fathers who governed us in this world, imperfect though they might have been. How then will I be a parent and a Christian and fail to correct my own children? 
How would I leave them without that kind of guidance? Because I might get it wrong? Well, yes, you are going to get it wrong sometimes. But you're going to have to make the call because that's what your children need. So again, what parent can fail to keep the children submissive? Is there any Christian who can just let them do what they want? Teach them to rebel. Teach them to have no respect for authority here, there, or anywhere. No, you can't do that. No Christian can live like that. No Christian parent is allowed to do that. If that's how you're teaching your children, then we need to talk, and you need to repent. You can't treat your children that. Nobody can. Whether you're trying to be an elder or not, that's irrelevant. <laughs> you can't live that way. 1 Timothy 3.6 also says, not a recent convert. This is a fun one. Um, not a recent convert. Well, what can you do about that if you were baptized yesterday? Nothing. <laughs> you can't do anything about that. You were baptized yesterday. You're a recent convert, man. <laughs> yeah. The fact is that the elder has to be somebody who has been a Christian long enough that he's mature in the faith. There's no getting around that. There's an element of time there. And in this sense that he has to have had time to mature in the faith, I guess, in that limited sense of there has to have already elapsed that amount of time, well, then it's a tighter requirement for the elder than it is for people generally. Like, there's no way for you to obey the gospel, and then we're saying, hey, man, how come you haven't been a Christian for three years already? That doesn't make any sense, right? Obviously, that's not enjoined. In the same way that you don't have to marry to be right with God, and you don't have to become a parent to be right with God. Obviously, if you just obeyed the gospel, we're very glad that you did, and you're not at fault for not having three years under your belt already. <laughs> Right? It should be obvious. But the other thing that maybe is less obvious is that everybody is supposed to mature. You say, I wasn't born yesterday. Yeah, but, but maybe you were literally just born yesterday in the Lord, born again of water and spirit. But how long do you get to stay in the situation of, well, I just got here. I really don't know. What's going on? Isn't it the case that when you obeyed the gospel, you pressed on to maturity? You wanted to know more? You read your Bible every day? You prayed? You asked for studies? If not, why not? Don't you want to learn? Don't you want to grow? Who is exempt from pressing on to maturity? I mean, the Bible is full of admonitions to learn, to grow, to mature in the Lord. That's It's everywhere. But I've picked this example in Hebrews 5. It's 11 to 14, and you're probably familiar with it, and that's fine, but I'm going to read it again. About Melchizedek, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain, since you've become slow to hear. That's what it says. Not dull, slow. <laughs> I left Melchizedek in here, by the way, just so that you can take an inventory on your own. Do you understand Melchizedek? Why he is there? What that is about? Because, I ask you, because actually the rest of Hebrews goes on to explain it. How long have you been a Christian? And do you understand Melchizedek? And when will you understand Melchizedek? And how long will that take? Just a question. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is just a child, a baby. Solid food is for the mature, those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Right. If we are continually not able to distinguish the difference between good and evil, we are not mature the way we are supposed to be mature. Something is wrong. That should be investigated and looked at. Why is it that I remain unskilled in the word, unable to distinguish good from evil? Which I ask not anybody here, because I think anybody here is doing this, but I mean from the text, I think these are the, these are the questions that you come away from. 
or come away with. We are all supposed to grow. We are all supposed to gain. He started with, by reason of time, you ought to be teachers. Like, you've been Christians long enough that you should be teaching these people and uh, who have received the letter to the Hebrews. But it seems like you need to be taught the basic principles again. You're back to the milk, not the solid food. Well, who eats the milk? Well, the baby eats the milk. Why? Because he ain't got no teeth. <laughs> he can't eat solid food. He doesn't have teeth. But they do have teeth by the time they go to kindergarten, that's for sure. They could bite each other pretty good. <laughs> His point, I think, is fairly clear. We're supposed to mature, we're supposed to grow, we're supposed to learn. How much time, though? See, then you want to get down to it a little bit. Well, oh, but when is he mature? Like, how much time are we really talking about? Because I read in H.E. Phillips that it might take him 30 years. Yeah, no, wrong. I don't know why he said that. Well, actually, I might think that I know why. But anyway, that's not the point. Let's go with what the New Testament says about it. This term... Um, New convert is literally neophyte. Okay, neophyte. What is that? It is a new plant, a sapling, or a sprout, depending on what kind of plant, right? I think saplings are baby trees and sprouts are baby vegetables, right? I think that's the case. I don't, I'm not good at this, you know, agriculture thing. I went to UT. You were <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, this word neophyte is, while it's true that obviously there's a time element here and that this is something that's a new plant or a recent plant, obviously, because it is a sapling or it is a sprout, but it's not really about the time. It's about the nature of the thing, the character of the thing, the maturity of it. When it's mature, it's a tree. When it's not mature, it's a sapling. But aren't they both trees? Well, yes, one's a baby tree and one's a mature tree. Fair enough. That's all we're getting at. So the, the new convert is less about time frame and more about quality or character. Is he mature in the faith? Nonetheless, you say, I still want a time. Well, we have one explicit time frame given to us in the New Testament, which is the elders at Ephesus, some Ephesians who obeyed the gospel in Acts 19, verse 5, became elders by the time you get to Acts 20, verse 17. That Acts 19, verse 5 is the first time that you have Christians at Ephesus. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ at that time. In Acts 20, at verse 7, Paul was able to summon to himself elders from the church at Ephesus. This is after having written 1 Timothy 3, the very instructions we're going through right now. These people became elders. In Acts 20, verse 31, it is recorded that he spent three years among them. So in this particular case, three years and some months from the time he left Ephesus to the time he summoned them to him was enough time for some of those individuals to have become not a recent convert. So yeah, 30 is way off by a factor of 10. Um, could there be people who after three years are not mature? Obviously so. We just read about them in Hebrews 5. By the time, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but need to learn again. Yeah. And, you know, you and I both have known Christians who have been Christians for 10, 20, 30 years who ought to know better and don't. That isn't right, and it shouldn't slide. But I think the point is the same. I'm not saying three years is it. That's all you can require. That's not the point. The point is that it's at least possible that inside three years, somebody might attain to that quality of maturity in the faith. And there, when we get to Titus, I think that level of maturity becomes a little bit clearer. So maybe if you're willing to suspend judgment there for a minute, we'll get back to that. But again, can anybody stop maturing? You obey the gospel, you're a neophyte, you stay that way forever, you, you, don't, you never learn any more than... 
repent, you know, believe, be, be, you know, be baptized, you know, like you really never learn anymore. You don't progress. You don't grow. You don't mature in the Lord. You're not able to teach other people like, no, that's not right. Something's not right. Nobody is allowed to stop maturing before they reach maturity. You have to continue to grow. Um, all Christians are to do that. Although it is definitely the case, you're not going to be point, appointing somebody who is a recent convert. It has to be somebody mature. And like I said, Titus sheds light on this and that he, the, the elder is supposed to be the person who is capable of rebuking people who contradict the doctrine of the Lord. So there's a, there is an element of strength there that is over and above. I understand. We'll get to that. The point of this lesson is, you know what these terms mean. They're not mysterious. They're not, they're not crazy. They're not super. They're not impossible. I'm out of time, and there's just more that has to be done. We don't have time to cover the rest of this at the moment. So we'll pick up Well Thought Of by Outsiders at the next opportunity and immediately... We will move on to the ones that are in Titus 1 about he must hold fast or hold firm the trustworthy word. He must be able to give instruction in healthful teaching, and he must be able to rebuke those who contradict healthful teaching um, in a separate lesson because we're out of time. But again, I think the point of this one, I hope, can be clear in your mind that indeed you understand what it is that you're looking at there in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1. You're looking for a faithful Christian, a faithful husband, a faithful father. If you are a Christian, this is how you live. If you are a husband and you are a Christian, this is the kind of husband you have to be. If you are a Christian and you are a father, this is the kind of father you have to be. That's what you're looking for. Can you say that you are living in the faith? Can you say that you are living right? Then, yeah, that's what we're looking for. And it's not more than what anybody has to do as a child of God in that sense. Uh, again, admitting that there is a maturity here, a maturity aspect and an ability to deal with troublesome problems that we will talk about, and that is not loosened, that's not negotiable. <laughs> but to get across to you that the meanings of these things are th stuff that you understand. They're very straightforward, simple meanings, New Testament teaching about Christian living. You do know what they are. You know whether you're doing them. That's the point. I thank you for your kind attention. If today you are not a Christian, not a child of God, why not? Why not obey the gospel before it is too late and be saved from your sins? We'll help you to obey the gospel in the name of Jesus to be baptized for forgiveness, where his blood washes away everything. Today, are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent. Make things right. Get back to the place where you ought to be, reaching towards maturity, learning how to show submission, submission and obedience in life in many different forums and stages. The things that we see in the elders there, they're not just something for somebody else. They're for all of us to be striving to attain to this level of goodness and maturity in our lives. All of us should be doing that. If we can help you with our prayers on your behalf as a Christian, or if we can help you to obey the gospel, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the, the song that has been selected. <laughs>